After weeks of outrage, there is a report the FBI is now looking into controversial pardons issued by Kentucky's now former Republican governor, Matt Bevin. Just before leaving office on December 10th, Bevin handed out more than 600 pardons and sentence reductions. Those included pardons for men convicted of child rape and murder whose families had supported Bevin's campaign. Last week, Democratic members of the Kentucky state legislature called for a special prosecutor to look into the pardons. One of those Democrats, Kentucky State Representative Chris Harris, told the Louisville Courier-Journal that he has since heard from, quote, a criminal investigator asking what Harris knew about Bevin's last-minute pardons. Two sources with knowledge of the inquiry told the Courier-Journal it was an FBI agent who spoke with Harris. NBC News has reached out to Bevin, but he has not responded, and the FBI is not commenting. In a statement to NBC News, Harris said, quote, I am happy to confirm I was contacted by a person in the law enforcement community. During the call, the investigator asked questions about the pardons, and it was my inc- clear impression that an investigation was ramping up. Let's bring in Chuck Rosenberg, former U.S. attorney and a former senior FBI official. Chuck, thanks for joining us. Um, let me start because it, it does seem the particulars here are new, but the idea of a controversy over a last minute pardon by a governor or, for that matter, a U.S. president, not new. And where these things usually seem to land, in my experience, is the politician who's leaving office does something that's considered extremely distasteful with a pardon. And there's a frenzy to find out, is there anything the public can do about this? And the answer usually seems to come back no, because the pardon power is very broad and very clear. Is that likely to be the case here or could this be different? Uh, no, the pardon power is very broad and very clear. You're exactly right, Steve, both uh, under Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution for a president and, by the way, under Section 77 of the Kentucky State Constitution for the governor of Kentucky. And so the thing we look for uh, is not whether somebody acted uh, you know, rashly or recklessly or foolishly or imprudently, uh, but whether they acted corruptly. If the pardon was corrupt... The pardon still stands, but there could be repercussions for the governor. How is something like that proven? Just again, given how broad and clear this power is, how would uh, corrupt intent be provable from a criminal standpoint? Sure. Well, intent is always the hardest thing to prove because you have to get into someone's brain in order to figure out what it was they were planning to do or intending to do. Uh, trying to do. Uh, But investigators do this all the time. I mean, the FBI is very, very good at public corruption cases, and they build it through documents and through cooperating witnesses and circumstances. And so if there is an investigation, I can assure you uh, that investigators are looking at um, the records of the people who were pardoned and whether uh, they or their families have any financial connections to the governor, whether money was raised by these families uh, in order to try and you know, buy a pardon. Uh, if they turn up in the, uh, evidence of that, Steve, it could be a problem for the governor. Yeah, I mean, does that, the, the kind of evidence you're talking about, does it, end, does it have to end up being almost, is, yeah, term smoking gun, somebody saying on tape, I got the money, now I'm going to give the pardon, that sort of thing. My mind goes back to, to Bill Clinton with Mark Rich, the final days of Bill Clinton's presidency, this yeah. international fugitive whose wife, he was very, ex-wife he was very close to, had given a, a ton of money to the Clinton Library, I think to Hillary Clinton's Senate campaign, got this extremely controversial pardon. The FBI looked into it and basically said, can't prove anything here. Right. Well, look, smoking guns are, um, you know, few and far between in real life. I mean, we talk about it a lot. You occasionally see it in the movies. But in real life, you prove cases through uh, primarily circumstantial evidence. In other words, we infer things from circumstances. Uh, And the law is very clear. Circumstantial evidence is every bit as compelling, uh, every bit as lawful, and every bit as admissible as direct evidence. And that's the way you have to prove these cases. And that's hard. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.